Well, before I get started, I want to give you a sense of who we are, who WebMD is, in case of those of you who aren't familiar. Uh, there really are two chief sides of the business. There is the consumer side of the business as well as the professional side of the business. When we think of the consumer side of the business, there are two chief platforms in the United States. Uh, America is actually number one trusted brand in healthcare information, known as WebMD.com. Um, and then in the UK, we also have a relationship with Boots. So there is BootsWebMD.com as well, which is UK specific. On the professional side, we have our global website for phys clinicians and physicians, uh, known as Medscape. I say global because we have 3.2 million physician members only 664,000 of which are actually in the United States. And our content is available in five languages, English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, and German. Okay. Oh, and last but not least, we are registration-based. So, a few disclaimers before I get started. I'm not from here. I'm an American. I will not spell behavior with a U or realize with an S. I apologize. So, yeah, look, we've seen this statement a million times, content is king and context is queen. But, you know, as in, especially in pharmaceutical marketing, as we get more advanced and we get more mature, that is becoming ever more important. Context isn't only queen. I like to say she rules the roost. So what does that mean, though? And what does that mean when we think about a clinician in terms of context? First of all, who are they? What specialty do they practice? What profession are they? Are they a physician's assistant? Are they a doctor? Are they a nurse? Are they a pharmacist? What's their age? What's their geography? Where did they go for their information? Do they go to governmental sites like the National, National Health Services or the NIH? Do they go to online journals such as the BMJ? And apologies to my non-BMS uh, and GSK colleagues here today, but since I was following a GSK speaker and I have a BMS speaker after, I featured them. So some physicians might go to pharmaceutical industry sites to get their information. And last but not least, and obviously most near and dear to my heart, the idea that they go to third-party HCP portals specifically designed for them. What do they do? What formats are they looking for? Is it print? Is it TV? Is it tablet? Is it mobile? Is it desktop, laptop? Important to know all of that. When do they come? Time of day, as equally as important as seasonality. When should we engage them? And why? Why do they come? Why do they come seeking information? Either because patients may have asked some questions. It may be something they saw in the news. It could be something a colleague asked them or challenged them with. All of these five W's are really important to driving meaningful engagement. The who, the where, the when, the what, the why. So what I'd like to do for the rest of this presentation is take third-party data from Manhattan Research East, focused on the EU specifically, and unpack a deeper understanding of the five W's of meaningful engagement, and then demonstrate how Medscape has really taken these five W's, incorporated them in the fabric of how we serve up our physicians to really drive actual tangible and feasible, which even gives me goose flesh when I think about it, case study that I'll share with you of how we are actually shaping modern medicine by doing this. Goose flesh, right? Not goose bumps, right? Go good. I wasn't sure. So who are they? 66% of physicians are age 45 or older, median age being 49 in the EU. Why do I point this out? I think it's important that when we think of modalities of content, that we think of everything from interactive tools to the idea of flat HTML. They're equally important. We need to be sure that we're addressing the learning needs and engagement styles of every age bracket possible. It's not just millennials who are engaging digitally online. It actually skews older, and that's important. Equally as important, these, these physicians are actually seeing a lot of patients. I mean, more than half of them are seeing a hundred or more patients weekly. And when you think about the fact that about 60, 59 percent of them are spending six or more hours with these patients, that's meaningful ability to influence and inform that physician to make the best decision for their patient. So online physicians are critically important in driving the market. And where do they do it? Where do they practice? You know, it, it, it's kind of close to equal, um, more leaning obviously towards the academic and hospital institutions, but also about 42% in solo group or clinic practice. 
So where are they? Specifically, what I mean by where are they, where are they looking? Not, you know, where are they, per se, are we in the UK, but where are they looking? Look, search is the predominant form. I think that's natural human behavior when you go online. I don't think that should be of any surprise to anybody in this room. But I think what's of critical importance when you look at this slide is what, and what is more important is what do they do after they search? Where do they go? So as you can see, online journals and third-party um, HTTP sites such as Medscape are the preferred format. About 37% are going to pharma websites, but the 61% stats on the right side of the slide, those are indicative of the fact that overwhelmingly physicians are feeling that these sites, these pharma websites, are overly complex or not necessarily addressing exactly the informational needs that they're seeking. And a lot of this is due to the fact of the regulatory environment that we're all hand-strapped hand with, trying to get great information out there, but we paint ourselves into a corner. And I think that's where the online journals and also the third-party HTTP websites really fit in. And as no surprise, this you know, activity, this, this huge amount of activity is driven by the fact that 37% of EU physicians are saying that they have limited rep access. And I'll get to another stat and that, that demonstrates that they only think that that's going to get more and more challenging as time goes on. And so it's important that we be any place, anywhere, on any device. Interestingly enough, 91% of EU physicians report using their smartphone for medical or professional purposes on a daily basis. I have to tell you what I think is interesting about that is in America, only 82% report it. So mobile is important, critical to modern medicine, but even more so, I think, in this market. Okay, what do they want? Well, listen, that depends is the answer. That depends on where they are. For example, if they're on a professional journal or a third-party site such as Medscape, you tend to see them engaging in what I like to call open-ended info-seeking behavior, meaning they're looking for new drug information, they're looking for disease state slideshows, they may be looking for, you know, independent medical education. But when you look at when they actually go to industry sites, what they're doing, the mindset shifts because of the context. The mind shift, shifts to more transactional behavior. Journal reprints, do you offer samples? Can you get me patient education materials that I can hand out? But when you take that branded information and you integrate it into a third party site like Medscape or an online journal, that behavior radically changes because the context in which that content is presented now leads them to engage in a more info-seeking, informational, engaging, uh, engaging way. So engaging with the same content, but because of the context, the behavior of what they're doing is changing. When do they access it? So, no surprise, and thank God for me. 83% of physicians report using or spending an hour or more with digital resources at work. That's about the same amount of time that they spend doing their patient paperwork. I just think that's kind of interesting. Equally important, 69% around that all-important moment, that point of care, report using their desktop or their laptop. And 52% are accessing their smartphone for digital resources or on or around those points of care. Again, very important moment for you to get in there to influence and inform that individual. And again, 46% are using search engines. But again, more importantly, where are they going? So there's a little text below down here. 42% are using third-party apps provided by healthcare portals like Medscape versus 11% are going to pharma websites. So really, really important point that when you're thinking about, you know, promoting your product, thinking about where you put it in the context becomes critically important. Why do they engage? No surprise. When I was young, health was more about the idea of you were sick and you went to the doctor, and more and more it is evolving. It is becoming equally about as being well as much as it about is it's about treating disease. So 99% of survey physicians in the EU actually report that they're being driven by their patients to seek more information because they're more invested in their care. And look, we talked about the rep access um, issue earlier, but to add on to that, 40% only expect that, light, that restriction to increase. Now you put that in the landscape of the following things, the dynamic of health becoming equally about wellness as about um, 
as about being sick, which is a barrier to efficiency for the physician. He has more patient load, more times with patients, less time to interact. And then you couple that with our challenges as marketers, right? The challenge that I talked about earlier where our regulatory environment is forcing us to give them information that we think they want based on the rules that we're given, but it's not necessarily what they really are seeking. So the idea of kind of infusing or integrating promotion into a third-party resource which is not hamstrung by such restrictions is actually quite appealing to the physician. Okay, so now, how do we apply this at Medscape? That's really what I want to kind of show you. So I'm going to just take a day in the life of a cardiologist because I just picked a cardiologist. I figured I was going after someone on PAH, feels good. So we're registration based, so we know who they are. We know where they live, we know how many years they've been in practice. From survey data, we know how many patients on average they see a week. I know what they read, I know what search terms they've used, I know what formats they prefer. I know whether they like news, whether they prefer education, whether they prefer our reference section within the site. So I know who they are, and I know what they do. And that, in turn, enables me to do precise targeting that is meaningfully driven, not only by who they are, but more importantly, by what they do, taking advantage of the digital long tail and really creating as large and comprehensive an audience as possible. And listen, that starts from the moment that they log in. Because they're registered with us and because we know who they are and because we know what specialty they practice, we have 33 different specialty home pages that aggregate content by specialty, bringing in the latest information from our relationship with over 100 plus journals worldwide, bringing in the latest from news, expert perspectives. We have bloggers, we have other collaborators, editors. Eric Topol, in fact, is our editor-in-chief, for those of you who are familiar with Eric Topol. So again, really, really huge value that everything is in a one-stop shop, really taking into the context the amount of time that they have, which is limited, to engage with this information. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a convergence happening. No one is going to argue that desktop is not important. I would never say that to anyone. But at the same time, mobile is taking on a more and more important you know, role in the medical landscape. And it really is, we believe, of critical importance to modern medicine. So we have made a significant investment in our mobile strategy and our mobile family, if you will. Our signature app, which most people are familiar with, is four plus star on, rated on Google. And it is a reference tool that clinicians use in or around the point of care to get those answers that they need at that critically important moment when they're seeing the patient. Our other two apps, relatively newer to the market, include a trend app called our MedPulse app with the logo there on the right. That really is about the latest in trends in different specialties and taking advantage of what's going on in social media. And also our CME app, which allows physicians to earn credits actually on the go. So I want to stop, finish with this story. So it is related to something that is really relevant right now and in the industry, Zika. Hot in the news, as you all are aware. We I launched a, a feature within our app and on our desktop laptop called Consult Q4 of last year. Consult is actually a closed environment for physicians only to exchange anonymized case studies and ask and collaborate in real time. And so when we put this out in the market, we really didn't know what to expect, and it was a pilot, and, and we were jazzed about it, but didn't know how it would be received. Well, within a couple of weeks after we launched it on November 12th, the Brazilian pediatrician, this is a true story, and this is what kind of gives me goosebumps, uh, true story, he said, look, I, I'm seeing patients who are pregnant who have Zika, and I'm noticing that there's a correlation between microcephaly and the Zika incidence. Is anyone else seeing this? And our Medscape moderator saw the volume of the conversation that this spurred globally, and it was a, a lot of interest. And so our moderators started monitoring it, monitoring that link at that time. Two weeks later, international health organizations such as the CDC and the NIH started tracking, perhaps there is a correlation two weeks after we were already kind of tracking the exact concept. And then on December 16th, our editors concluded that indeed there is, so we began to report on the potential link between Zika infection and microcephaly in newborns in 
in South America. Not until December 31st did one major news, news affiliate pick this up, and it was the New York Times, my hometown paper. So, but it was the first story, and it was on the front page. And the next online HTTP portal, at least stateside that reported on it, didn't do so until 2017. And so, listen, why I share this story for you is I think that we have created, by understanding how context works with physicians, a community of physicians that not only actively pursues information, reads, passively engages with content, but also actively collaborates with their peers to make better decisions, to really have better outcomes for their patients, and in turn, really shape modern medicine. So with that, thank you. Um, well, just, uh, and I, I want to ask you this question as well. So some of you who know me, I used to run the pharmaceutical team at doctors.net, so I have a bit of knowledge of this. But my massive frustration, and there'll be lots of people in the room here that are pharma and agency at doctors.net, was that what pharma wanted to share with doctors was the most awful 20-page detail I have ever seen. <laughs> And the problem is that generates revenue for you at Medscape, but you know it is not something that doctors want to see. That's Can you talk to me about how do you protect Ab the community? What, tell us a bit about that, how you do that. Yeah, well, uh, is the question more around how well, do we how Does do it happen a lot? What do you do? What, what yeah, do we what, do? How yeah, do you sure. cope with that? So look, I, I think we, we very collaboratively work with clients. I mean, we've done this numerous times. We had a client buy an e-detail program from us recently, and we were given... 200 pages worth of content. It, it was just like, okay, I understand that it was approved this way. I understand it feels really comprehensive and good, but for in terms of digital engagement and the way people use digital, that's just massively incongruent. So we were able to work with them to actually advise them on how to get it down to 25 slides and then put it in a linear program that still delivered the same message, worked collaboratively with their regulatory environment every step of the way. I think the important thing is to bring the customer into the experience of development as soon as possible because the further and further you go down the funnel, the more and more difficult it becomes. And I, I, I'd hate to take a stab in the dark and then work in, walk into a regulatory room and they'd be like, no, we're, we can't do this. So it, it made things a lot easier. That, that would be my advice. Good stuff. Right. Well, any, any questions from the audience? And then we'll get Rob and Albert out as well together. No? OK, let's bring you, bring you both out, and I'll bring some. Yeah. Rob, the, one of the words, the two words that were used uh, at the end of your session was medical and device. Yeah. Do you want I think it actually gives a level of um, quality to it. Uh, and I think actually if it is a medical device, then so, so be it. I mean, for me, it's just how we want to categorize. Um, I think actually over the last, oh God, five years, the whole kind of registering a medical device um, has been quite interesting from a, a regulatory perspective. But um, no, it's not something that, that fills me with dread and I think actually it, um, there's a, a device that's uh, sorry an app that we've already launched in asthma um, that's got that's going down that route at the moment so I'm fortunate that my colleagues on the respiratory side have already like treading a path so I'll have some kind of learns on what to do there was a question did you put your hand up before do you want to Hi, I'm Sharani from Merck. Um, we've been developing an app recently um, and had some major challenges with information governance and a number of the trusts. I'm wondering if you've experienced the same sort of challenges and how you've gone about overcoming them. Yeah, so I think obviously we're in that pilot phase. So I think um, there's definitely uh, strong governance around the, the data and how that's stored. But I think, um, as I said, in kind of answering the last question, I think that the, the luck that I've had in terms of having colleagues in a different department already doing it, they've kind of gone through the painful journey over the last kind of two or three years. So I'm just kind of saying, we're doing a similar thing. Uh, what are we doing? And we're set up to then manage that. Cool. Hi, Rob. Um, Kish Raj here from Be More Creative. Um, one of the challenges that we find when we're working with our clients when it comes to ideas like yours, which I think is brilliant, by the way, um, is how do you ensure um, longevity of the project? So, you know, who, who's in charge of that in terms of who's going to take over after perhaps you're not leading it or 
what patient groups, how are they planning to keep this going after yeah. 18 months, two years or whatever? So, so I, think, I think like any app, but my kind of like vision with, with that would be is that you know you need to update it um, like you would with any app. I think the way in which you want to manage that is not every like month. It's kind of like say you're going to do a biannual um, update to it and make sure we're budgeting uh, for that um, globally to help with the infrastructure. I think obviously what we'll need to do is market by market. The LOCs will need to manage that um, uh, for, uh, as well and put put budget in place so if they want to opt in and have it for that country then they're going to need to that do that moving forward and and actually you know if it well, there will become a point where actually it's it's not useful and there'll be new technology that takes place and then fine step back I think if I look at patient support when I joined the industry as Carwin kindly mentioned I've been been at GSK for almost 20 years in fact it's not true because it was GW back then but <laughs> uh, GSK didn't exist so um but I think when I, when I joined the industry, it was all paper-based, patient diaries, lots of print, lots of cost. And so that's kind of obsolete now. And I think there will be a point where that, where that happens. So I'm kind of happy for that, but we just kind of want to move with the times. OK, any others? Albert, one for you. You mentioned about mobile. It was more in Europe. I can't remember the number. 92% Europe, 82% in US. Uh, 91 in Europe, uh, 81%. Why? Would you know why? 82%. Uh, look, I, I, I was talking earlier uh, to a colleague of mine. I mean, I, I think it's, it's cultural. Um, we, we honestly have not adapted as much into a mobile devices. I think a lot of physicians, especially with the Affordable Care Act coming on, really felt compelled to go more digital by force rather than by choice. So I, I think that that has, a, has something to do with it. So I think asking people to change habits is a lot more challenging. They're not being mandated previously to change habits. Now they are, and I think when you're dragged screaming to something rather than evolving into it voluntarily, it presents a challenge. So I, I just think in terms of the market, I've always seen, you know, and it's not just limited actually to medicine. I mean, when I look at culturally America versus Europe, there's a lot of things that you guys do. Credit card, great example. We still have to sign all the time rather than use a chip and a pin. There, the technology industry in the United States, we just, we're kind of stuck in our ways. And so I think it takes us longer to evolve toward it. You do have culture, though. You have some things. Yeah. 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 We have some. Um, and the other question I wanted to ask you, there'll be people in here, UK people and European people, we're all sweating mildly about disclosure of payments. And they had the Sunshine Act coming into the, to Europe, into the UK. It has to be reported from someone who correct me, July this year, the previous 12 months, whatever it is. How, have you seen anything? Has that impacted what you do or what pharma does with you with regards to payment for physicians and all that stuff? In the US. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. massively, yes. Uh, a number of years ago, massively influenced the amount of payment uh, that you could give physicians to do something, the amount of reporting and recording of what you had to do in terms of if they did a speaking engagement on the behalf of a sponsor, what was the, you know, what was the honorary associated with it, and also then dealing with the caps and understanding not only what is that clinician doing with you, but what is that clinician doing with the variety of other providers is also, in a, which you may not have enterprise-wide visibility into. So yeah, it, it is a challenge. I mean, it remains a challenge, and it's just led to more documentation, more paperwork, and it doesn't make it as easy as it used to be, for sure. And is it transparent? Can patients see it? No, 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 no. But it is, it is transparent uh, you know, within the medical community. It's not something that they, we're publishing out. I mean, I, I guess you could find it if you wanted to, but I don't think that it's readily available to consumers. We'll do one more question if anyone's got anything else to ask. Yeah, one more. Uh, Christian from Pharma Forum. Um, just a thought, there's obviously an increasing amount of patient support programs, apps, uh, the movement of more e-patients. I just wondered, Albert, from your perspective, how do you see the doctor community um, you know, accepting that movement at the moment with having more patients coming into you know, consultations with wanting to have more of a kind of level conversation, if you like, given the, the increasing amount of information out there? Yeah, and, and look, I, I think that's the holy grail, right? I, I think ideally what we all would love to do is to connect those two audiences. And, and, and the one thing that we've been able to do, which I think is, is, is really starting to test the waters, is 
looking at data, a big data on both sides, and how do I use that to maximize communication strategies? But to your point, the idea of true connection uh, through an application, through a mobile platform, through some sort of social platform is definitely something that we are actually actively exploring. But again, the, the regulations and, and, and the laws and, and HIPAA violations in the United States you know, really have to create a secure technology environment in which we know it cannot be compromised. Um, so, you know, PHI creates a problem, personal health information and potentially access to it. And also creating a comfort level within the patient community that indeed when I engage through this, I, I am secure. No one's going to get access to the fact that, I don't know, I have eczema or, or what have you. Um, so, look, I think it's somewhere where we will go for sure. And I know we are on that path. I think it's going to take us some time to get there, but I definitely think consult is the first step toward it. Great. Right. Um, before we thank you, Albert, you're leaving at half three. I am. Okay. Uh, if anybody, the WebMD team, there are people from WebMD here. Put your hands up, wave. Yeah, okay. So, and you're here tonight as well? Yeah. So if anyone's got any questions, try and recognize those three or they'll stalk you probably with business cards during the evening maybe. I don't know. But, but if any other questions about WebMD, again, chat to those guys there. Rob, you've got a call at six, but you're around this evening as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, perfect. So Rob's here as well. So anything you want to follow up with Rob, please chat to him in one of the breaks or also um, this evening. But please join me again in thanking Rob and Albert. <laughs>